Travel Tours. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Travel Tours. This is Richard. I'm kind of changing things up a bit. I think I've been a little bit robotic in the way that I've approached Travel Tours. So we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, let's see, how do I want to put this? We're going to be a little bit more informal. Uh, I hope that you like this, and I hope it, it frees up the the person that I'm talking to. I don't really want to call these interviews. I want to, I'd prefer to call them conversations. So thank you very much for tuning in. We do appreciate you listening to Travel Tours. Today we are talking with Lisa Flor in France. We're going to call this episode Lisa Flor's Bizarre Expat Exploits. So please help me in welcoming Lisa Flor to Travel Tours. I'm going to give you, before we start talking with Lisa, I'm going to give you a little bit more background on her. Now she's lived in France almost 20 years. She uh, informally has done one-to-one -one tours and, and has settled a number of people who have moved to France, getting them acclimated to their new life in France. Now, other than um, <laughs> the common perception of France, not everything is uniform in France, and we're going to talk about that with Lisa. So, Lisa, I appreciate you coming on and speaking with us today, and I did have some technical difficulties, so Lisa has been a trooper and has uh, has allowed me to to call her and, and continue this today. So, Lisa, I thank you for that, and, I, and I, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Well, you're very welcome, and I can hear you fine now. It's working fine now, so let's go. Okay. What would you like to know? <laughs> First of all, Lisa, just tell us, give us a little background about yourself so the folks know uh, how long you've been there, what you've been doing, what, why you decided to, number one, why did you decide to come to France? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, I'm 56 years old. I'm from Ohio originally. I lived for 17 years in, in New York. And the U.S. became untenable for me for various reasons, which we can go into if you want to. So I expatriated in 1994, and starting at the end of 93, I tried to find out what I should do to move to France. I was, back in the 80s, I wanted to move to Italy to live and work for some period of years, because I really like Italy, and I studied there briefly. Um, but I ended up in France. I, I sort of missed, but we're next door. And I always intended to return to the United States, but um, my last two visits were not pleasant, so I'm over here permanently. I'm still a U.S. citizen, though, and uh, I'm also a full French citizen, and I have been since 1999. So even though I really did my level best to try to find out what I should know and should do to get over here, I found a dearth of reliable, up-to-date, comprehensive material. And in fact, that material, now that I'm here, I realize cannot possibly exist. Uh, I know that uh, we've talked before that you, did, that you always do a lot of research in different things that you, that you take on. So, I'm a former research assistant, so there you it's go. natural for me. Yeah. There you go. So Lisa, so you did a lot of uh, as much research as you could before coming to France. So mm -hmm. now, was it was it your marriage that actually brought you, or was it prior to your marriage that that? Uh, what is the catalyst here? What was the catalyst that brought you? Well, uh, I did know that I at least wanted to live and work in Europe, uh, on the continent, for some period of time. Um, so. And, and I already knew that, uh, uh, at least Italy, I, I liked. But that was just about it, except that the U.S. wasn't working for me anymore. All the, the laws always seemed to be against me. And um, I just, also because of my background as a Wall Street analyst and um, a journalist in the United States and the other things that I did, I could see the writing on the wall, at least for myself in the United States. I felt that the picture was not good for the USA. I was very concerned, but I realized that I couldn't do anything about it really that much about it personally. And for myself in my own situation, things were really, they, 
they were untenable. So, you know, so uh, through a, a twist of events uh, which defy description, I, I ended up coming over here to France, and I did have some contact here uh, as a writer, and I needed to come on a business and pleasure trip to Paris to meet an editor that I had worked with and, you know, sort out some things and get some more work. And once you've written a while for an editor, it was for a French magazine that no longer exists, it's really best to meet them face-to-face at some point so that you can have a rapport and give them what they want and they need for their readership. So it was a combined thing. And while I was over here, I met one of my fans who had been sending me amazing mail for years. And um, we ended up deciding that week that we must be together. And so I had to go back to New York and finish my divorce for a long-term marriage that had not worked out and tell a fiancé who had waited for me for 20 years that I wasn't going to stay and get over here and marry this little French guy who was who is way younger than I am. Let's stop and you this, just for a second and let people know here, I, I didn't really mention it in the introduction, yeah. that Lisa is a uh, fairly well-known artist and has a number of her pieces in different museums in Europe. And actually, you have a piece in MoMA as well, Lisa, is that correct? Yes. Uh, my work is in a lot of major museum permanent collections and some small ones, and the book Modern Women by the Museum of Modern Art. I had my second group show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I'm in Mexico, Sweden, some other countries, I don't remember. And uh, it has uh, six pages about me. I got three color plates <laughs> and some small museums also. That's, that's because amazing. I was, I, that's I was originally amazing. an artist and an art student, so it follows. Well, you have a very diverse life. It's a, that's what I've always found interesting about you. Art let's, and the sciences, yeah. Let's, um, I don't want to go too far afield here, but I do want to also talk to, tell people that you, you started the first, uh, what is it, the punk rock fanzine? Is that correct? Or the first <laughs> fanzine? I'm not, I'm a little... No, not the first, but um, it was very seminal. Um, the first one was called Modern Girls, and since I, I started it in 1976 in Ohio at college, and I got Patti Smith to write for it and William S. Burroughs, and I put a lot of crazy stuff in there and my own artwork and writing, and I did not have access. I knew how to do offset printing and, and stuff like that. I mean, I, I knew how to do letterpress even, um, but I didn't have any of that stuff. I, I was this penniless student. So I was cutting up things with scissors and using glue to stick them down on paper. And I sent some copies over to England to people like the guy who was doing Smith and Glue. And the poison pen punk style, it was either simultaneously or I got copied. And the next thing I saw, the Sex Pistols had, never mind the Bullocks, you know, and with these poison pen style things, it was very punk. Now, but, that was 1979, 1980. What's the time frame we're talking oh, about? Oh, 76. Okay, so it was even back in 76 then. That's yeah, when you started. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, more like 75, but I started really publishing this stuff and sending it out in 76. Before that, I had just been doing mail art and stuff like that. But you did start, I mean, that was the start of the fanzine. I remember seeing a, a science fiction fanzine around that same time, 74, 75. Yes. So that was kind of the start sort of, of the fanzines, I think, wasn't it, back then? Pretty much. There was something that was going on in the 70s, especially among teenagers, called FBs and slams. And, and slams were when you create a little magazine yourself with paper and a stapler and glue and everything and different colored pens or whatever you want. And you mail it to somebody, and it's got questions in there and five or 10 or 20 people, you, you have to fill out every page by hand, answer the questions, and then the last person to do it mails it back to you. And FBs were just friendship books, and people would send them around and put their name and address and what they were looking for in the way of contact and, and pals, and, you know, it was just teenage stuff, you know. 
But out of that, you know, a lot of these people who were doing these little goofy, little young 12 and 14 year old teenager things, we liked Star Trek and comics and art and dragons and all the sorts of things like that and science fiction, all kinds of stuff. And some political stuff too, especially where I come from. And uh, we just started self-producing little zines. There were a lot of them. I don't want to get too far off course because we're going to talk mm. mostly about France, but I did yeah. want you to, t to touch on that because that's an amazing part of your life. And that, that can be a whole interview just in itself. Took me around the world and got, married, got me married three times, and I don't even like men. <laughs> so getting back to our, uh, our previous track, we were talking about you uh, meeting your husband as, as a fan and then divorcing and then coming to France and to be with him. So yeah. let's, let's pick up from there. Well, um, extricating myself from the USA actually took about seven months. Um, I was surprised because I'm a pretty organized person, but I had to change all my ID back to my maiden name. I had to clear up any debts, any taxes due. Uh, I decided to close all of my IRAs, my whatever 401k, annuities, whatever I had. I had carefully saved $20 a week for year after year, and I took a 10% hit and then owed a lot of taxes on that. And just the administrative stuff and finding out how to pick what I should send abroad and have it shipped also cost, you know, I owed over $10,000 in, in taxes and I, I paid it off. I was like, okay, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to pay it. I don't want any problems. And uh, to ship everything also cost well over $10,000, you know, and, and I'm really glad that I shipped the stuff out. Because the replacement cost over here would have just been like, you know, five times as much. Hmm. Now, that's interesting. I, I, would, I wouldn't have thought of that. I thought it would be cheaper just to leave your stuff and then just come over and buy new stuff. So that's interesting. It depends on where you're going. Well, these yeah. days, you know, the white people move around. Uh, I think it, what, what at one time in the United States, it was every seven years people would move. I'm not sure what it is with people having to find work these days. I'm sure it's gone down quite a bit. But here in Atlanta, you'd, there would be certain sections of Atlanta that you would just, this was years ago, still to a degree, but, but not as much as it used to be. There were like Midtown and different areas where people were always moving and they just leave their furniture. They would sell it and just you know yeah. take very few things with them. So you'd, you would know to go to those areas to pick up good bargains and you know Absolutely. for yard sales. So. I remember that's how it was in New York City. A lot of people would arrange to leave their large furniture in their apartments, you know, because it was just too hard to get down the steps or whatever, you know. And so that was kind of good. <laughs> I yeah. still have furniture now I found on sidewalks in New York. Well, you know, <laughs> Midtown here in Atlanta has always been the uh, the um, the gay area of town. It's always been where, where people would go and... Um, so you would get these really fine pieces of art and it'd be amazing what you would find that people would just leave. But you also yeah. had the other community, which were a lot of transients. So Midtown has always been kind of a mixture of, of uh, avant-garde and uh, transients and, and the mixing together. It's, it's been kind of wild over the years. Now it's very gentrified, but years ago it was a lot different. Well, so, I remember in the lower side of lower east side of New York, people would drape their nice old clothes that they didn't need anymore over the railings in the hallways. And as you went down all the steps, you know, they were usually six-story buildings, you could pick what you wanted. And as a courtesy, the person would go back at the end of the day and take whatever wasn't collected and really throw it out. That's interesting. But I, I got a lot of clothes that way. Huh, that's pretty cool. I like, everybody, I like that. everybody did that, yeah. yeah. Well, Lisa, now let's talk a little bit about, because you have so much experience helping people settle in France. Let's talk about the realities and, and the fallacies that people, uh, too many times, well, most people, let's be truthful, most people just go on vacations. They don't usually resettle, or not as many people resettle and spend years overseas or, or as an expat. 
And if they do, typically, I was talking to somebody recently who's lived outside the country for over 15 years. Typically, the longest time someone will stay out is between three to seven years. And after that, they give up and they just go back to their home country. Yeah, and here here in Paris, they, they frequently don't even last beyond a year, really. Wow, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So tell, explain it's, a little bit about that. What, what, what can you, how can you help people uh, make the transition here? What have you found out over the years? Well, first of all, try, try to, um, try to visit a few times. You know, look and see, learn about. If you, if you think you love France, you know, there's plenty out there that you can look at to get a general idea of the country. The, you know, it has a lot of different climates and and stuff going on, and Pick an area or two that you think you like, and ideally visit one to three times in the first year, or even better than ideally, just go on a sabbatical for 12 consecutive months and rent in a place where you think you'd really like to settle, because you won't know until you've been there during the bad weather and the boring times, and you really see what the people are like then, you know, that's... That's my best advice for this point. But say if you were having to, to relocate, say for business or something, you, you had to come over there. I know you've done mm. this informally where you've helped people settle in. What would I you, have. What, what would you tell people? Or uh, and, and still informally, you, you know, I understand that you still do that and, and can, can help people. if they. I if still do that informally, yeah, yeah. Informally. So they can't contact you for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they could, yeah, they could. Now we've talked previously on our, on our pre-interview about the how France is not very uniform. So let's talk a little bit about that because in in films right. and in television, we're we're told a narrative story that's going to make France and everything always look more or less ninety-five percent of the time look like smooth sailing. So mm -hmm. let's talk about a little bit of the disconnect between the the the, the reality and the you know the pie in the sky type thing right when i when i went to the french consulate in late 1993 um i was very lucky because the guy actually looked around to see who was listening and then he whispered to me nothing is uniform over there they say it is but it's not every region every town every city every administration do things differently if you challenge it, they will deny it. <laughs> so, you know, trying to get a lot of information is probably going to be useless for wherever you go. He said, just go. But what he didn't tell me was to get my passport stamped when I landed. <laughs> you have to always do that. Get a physical stamp on your passport when you land, when you travel anywhere. So, Lisa, tell me now, let's go through the steps. If since you've done this informally over the years, kind of a step-by-step, -step, what do you do for folks? What specifically do you do for them? Well, it's really fun to, for instance, if they just want to come over here and have a nice vacation, to just send them an email and ask them 10 or 20 questions about who they'll be traveling with, what their health is, what their age is, what interests them, uh, you know, and customize an itinerary for them. And then they can just really do that on their own. Now, some people really like meet and greet and like a little babysitting at the beginning because it can be very disorienting here. And, you know, a lot of people come over like, well, Paris, everybody picks Paris, which is kind of silly. But, um, okay, for Paris, they just, they just, Travel, they come here at the wrong time of year. They come in July or August, which is insane. And uh, they just, they're, I remember my first time here, I was, I was overwhelmed. I didn't know what to see. So they just end up at the same old boring major places that they remember and that they know. And it probably has nothing to do with their business, uh, with their interests and their personal preferences. And there's usually always 10 places better right next to it that they could get into for free without any crowds, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I like to do that. And then if they really need meet and greet, you know, I like to take them the cheapest way possible to get the transfer done 
comfortably to make sure they're okay, to get them into the best possible place, the best price for what they want to do, and install them, orient them in the neighborhood, explain a few basics, and be available for them. Okay, now is that, are you talking more about just the vacationer, or are you talking about someone that's come over to and moving into France, moving to France? Well, that is for mostly for just people who want to have a pleasure trip alone or with their families. But I've also done business facilitation, which is really cool. You know, that's when I meet business people, and I get them to where they have to go, and I stick with them, and I'm, I'm their multilingual secretary. I'm a trained stenographer. I'm a paralegal here. I understand the legal system, a lot of stuff. And whatever it is that they want to do or the context they make, well, first of all, a lot of people think it, it's going to happen in a moment, which it seldom does here. But I, I can make that happen for them very likely. And if I don't know, I can find out. I can do it right quickly, you know. Well, that's important because in any country that you, you don't speak the language, or even if you speak a little bit of the language, you know, we were talking in the pre-interview the other day about the differences between Canadian French and, and, and French spoken in France and how yeah. they, they have to have subtitles uh, in the films that are imported to France from... On, on TV. Yeah. If they, if they do a, a, a clip on French TV uh, with a Canadian French person speaking... It's subtitled in, in, in French. So, you know, that's a, that's a good example of why you need someone to help you. But in mm. France or any place, actually, where you go and, and don't speak the language, you've got to become yeah. acclimated. And it also helps in your transition where you're not as tense. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's worth worth the time and worth the money that's spent. You know, that's, that's so the too. problem. There's also... some people that don't want to spend the money, but it, it's worthwhile. Yeah. I can usually do everything for people that's necessary, and if I can, I can just take them to see somebody who who knows, or or make a phone call, or send an email, or something. You know. Let's yeah. no, okay. Let's get into the title here now. Let's get into the bizarre expat exploits. So tell me, give me, mm. give me some bizarre here. <laughs> I have a spicy past. I'm a former sex worker, but that was in the United States. And it's very sad how that happened, but um, I did it successfully for years off and on. And I always also had a straight life. So I had a double life. And people used to recognize me on the street. In New York. I would just smile. At, yeah. I would just smile at them, you know, in the elevator. We'd be standing there with our briefcases, and I'd be like, are you going to say anything? Because <laughs> I saw you last night, baby. But that's, <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a show in and of itself. What are some yeah. – let's, let's get to your <laughs> expat exploits. So what's some mm. bizarre, bizarre stuff in, in France? Well, I've been able to be the artist and writer I always wanted to be over here. I've been in movies. I've done radio. I've done simultaneous interpretation. I, I, I've been a journalist, all kinds of stuff. You know, this, this living here in Paris has freed me up creatively. And I just blossomed over here. But some of it was really, I like the offbeat stuff. I've been in underground movies, and I, I write for, besides mainstream press, you know, very strange underground things, not sexual. You know, uh, but, uh, well, I have, but, you know, um, and I've, I've just met a lot of weird people over here. I'm used to being in the demi monde because of New York. And uh, <laughs> do you have any specific <laughs> stories, though, that stick out in your mind? Any, any exploits and, or expat exploits that really stick out? Well, some of my slaves followed me over here from New York. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> and they hung around for years. It was just great, you know. I was always really nice to everybody, and so you know, it was it was cool. But um, you know, in my travels in Europe and and throughout France, I was going to write a, a book, but I lost I lost track with her of her. Um, I spent a week interviewing um, a retired prostitute in Paris. A whole week, and she was really nice, and she was successful, I guess. Uh, she wasn't in very good health. She was getting older, but uh, she told me all about how she got into it, 
and working in the windows in Belgium and and you know she she explained to me about the the whole world of how she got into it as a child, which is very sad, and why you know she was like you know from a gutter basically in, in Paris, and um, she explained to me how she avoided pimps and became independent and. Uh, you know, my mind was just blown. And I'm a portrait artist, so I did some portraits of her that I gave her for free, and she was thrilled. But she had this, like, jealous friend who, <laughs> and she relocated, and I, I couldn't find her to do what I wanted to do, so it's too bad. That's just one example. I yeah, mean, a well, whole week. Yeah. We were together 24-7. You know, we were sharing a room. <laughs> so you really, you really got in and really shared each other's lives then. Yeah. So that's, you know. <laughs> well, now let's get into a little bit more of the bizarre because let's let's. Uh, I've got to point this out, and I didn't point this out, and I apologize at the beginning here. Lisa has two YouTube channels. Well, you can go to cutecatfaith.com. Is it dot com or dot org? It's dot com, okay. and my my daily motion and YouTube channels, and and a small bit about me is on that website. So it's a good initial point, and there's a contact point there. But you do do daily videos, almost daily videos of your life in France, and pointing out uh, different uh, museums and just wherever you are in that day. It could be, in, you could be on vacation out in the countryside or you could just be walking down the street and something uh you know uh, meets your interest and you do a little video on it so that i think it's I worthwhile actually... for people to come and look at your oh, yeah. videos you get you give them a little taste of france and a little bit of the everyday life there some of it is in french sometimes they do some investigative journalism and they talk to people in french and try to add things in english you mm -hmm. know if i meet an interesting character here you know, I'll say, I've got a little camera here. You know, you want to let me record this? And frequently they'll say, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Um, and I've got some really weird ones up there. <laughs> bizarre. Very bizarre. One of them is this crazy guy here in my building. Uh, he's Actually, he's in a couple buildings down. And I, he's a murderer. And he told me things that I, people tell me things, you know. <laughs> And, okay, so I'm like, okay, fine, he's in my apartment, that's cool. Let's see his pictures and find out his story. And he had this amazing stuff. The day after Princess Diana's death, he went there, which was illegal. And he documented it and photographed it. <laughs> and he had forensic evidence. And he wanted to show me, so I made clips of it. <laughs> it's on YouTube. Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll get the funniest Persian accents and everything. And Oh, crazy guy. He seems very nice, but I, I was kind of scared. And then he brought these ghetto people up here. So I was talking to these, like, young black ghetto people. And, you know, they were really nice. I've always gotten along with people like that. It's really scary. Everything was fine. Well, you know, that's, that's a... That's getting up on another topic here. If yeah. someone is moving to France, you you see the surface, but you don't see the realities because there are a lot of minorities, and you do have a mashing yeah. of different uh, cultures there. So, yeah. would you say that it is a safe place, or you just have there are certain areas that you or you have to really be careful, or what is your because you're on the street? Every there are day. a couple. Yeah, there are actually more than a couple that I can think of areas in Paris that you want to avoid. I think one of them is the Barbès area, which is known as Goutte d'Or. And there's a popular youth hostel there. And, you know, I'm afraid to go by there in a car with the windows up and the doors locked in the daylight. And my spouse is Parisian, and he is too. And uh, there's another one. I don't remember which one. So what is, why, why are you, what, what makes that such a dangerous area, though? Is there a lot of crime committed there, a lot yeah, of robbery, yeah. or what, why is yeah. that dangerous? Just on the street, you know, you'll be picked clean. You know, the vultures are all there. You can see them. And Stalingrad is still pretty rough, too. Um, most of France is really safe with normal precautions, really. And most of Paris is very, very safe. I mean, you know, I don't like the RER trains, and I don't recommend them. And that's a, that's a, a commuter train. Um, 
and uh, they're not easy to use, but the regular metro and buses and streets, you know. Okay, Lisa, what is the difference? Is one underground, one above ground? Tell me a little bit more about that. The RER, and I do have some clips up about this, um, is a, a suburban. It's a suburban thing, a uh, train, but it does run through Paris, and it combines with the metro underground. A lot of it's above ground outside, but, you know, in Paris it's underground. So in Paris it can be used with a metro ticket, but it has a different ticketing system and everything. And um, these are just, they, they, I, I just don't like them. I, I don't feel secure on them, I've had problems on them, people trying to pickpocket me. But really never on the metro or the buses or the streets with normal precautions. Never. It just hasn't happened to me, and I don't know anybody else that has. So you're saying you've been you felt more secure and and have not had problems just on the regular bus system? Yeah, I use the buses a lot. I prefer them to the metro at this point. You know, I know that they're weird for people to use here, and that's one thing I enjoy showing them how to get around in the subways. Also, there's an extensive tramway network here now. It's all new, and they're adding more. And that's the same thing. The buses, the tramways, the metros use the same ticket, and they're just great. And things are pretty well indicated. And I know people are scared because they're like, well, I don't want to be standing out there in a near suburb with no bus shelter, and I don't know what's what. But, you know, I can take five minutes and say, look, you know, there's something posted here. You know the bus number. You can see the schedule, you know. You know, wear a raincoat. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, you know, I we were, like it. We were talking the other day. There's something that your husband mentioned about it. A 12-month, what was that that we were talking about the other day? About 12-month disconnect or something like that? Something, do you know, remember what I was talking, what we were talking about? Mm, I'm not 12 sure. 12 months over vacation, something like that. Well, yeah, it's a, it's, it's ideal to be able to stay here for 12 months and just rent. And I find out about places all over France of expats who have a job someplace else for a year, and they want to rent their whole house furnished with all the utilities and the internet and everything and orient people. There was one down in Montbéliard recently that I looked at myself because this was a nice place, and that's a nice town, and there's work down there, too. And there's a lot to see touristically. And I was trying to find somebody for her, but she found somebody really quickly. But these things do come up. It's just that they're not advertised. It's, it's very networked. Now, when you're talking about work, if someone were to come over and say they were trying to find work, do they have to be a, a, a UE, UE citizen, or, excuse me, EU citizen, or... How easy is it to find work? I understand that you, that you have to go through a lot of paperwork uh, yeah. in order to start a business there, similar to other countries. It, it can be quite a bit of money to, to start up a business and even to even more sometimes to close it down. Well, yeah. And let's talk about the work permit thing. You can always apply for a visa, a work visa. And it, it's, it's a lot of forms to fill out, and they're in French, and you have to jump through all the hoops and pay the fee and send it in. But if you can get one, then, then you're going to have no problem for a year for full-time work. And employers don't sponsor. I, it's extremely rare. Um, so you have to do that yourself. You can, um, uh, if, you're, if you have an EU passport, or you think you qualify for one, because maybe you have an Irish ancestor or you have an Italian relative who never renounced their Italian citizenship and you're a direct relative, you can probably get an EU passport. You might also be able to go to Iceland, which is a lovely country, I love it, and become a citizen there. Um, and then you get immediate citizenship and you know, then you have an EU passport. But I think you do have to renounce your uh, former citizenship for Iceland. Here in France, I didn't have to do that at the time. I'm still American and I'm French. That's but interesting. I hadn't heard about Iceland before. But yeah, again, you wouldn't yeah. be able to have dual citizenship, so that would be out for a lot of people. 
Well, I was I haven't been in Iceland since 2001, but I still have contacts there. I haven't really checked on this. But when I was there, um, during weekdays, uh, the whole process of becoming an Icelandic citizen took less than 30 minutes, and you qualified for immediate benefits. And But at that time, you did have to renounce any form of citizenship. But did they want you to have at least a college education? Because like, if you look at, at um, Australia and uh, I think it's New Zealand, they want better qualified people becoming citizens. So is that what that would be? A well, they, they don't well? want some... They don't really want some ignorant schlub, I suppose. Mm -hmm. At that time, they weren't that picky, but you did have to know what to say, and you did have to um, inform yourself in advance. You know, if you're going to work in Iceland, you're probably going to have to spend six months of the year in a fish factory and six months of the year on a horse herding sheep. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, or, or but you could always just say, you know, I want to build up the land. I want to work in agriculture. I want to improve the environment of Iceland. And if you're sincere and you speak English, because everybody is required to speak English there, and uh, the other two languages are Icelandic and Danish, um, German is a big help, or any Germanic language. Um, uh, if you know what you're getting into with Iceland, which is not, it's a, oh, I love it there. But, it, you know, a lot of Americans would just freak out if they had to live there. <laughs> you know? It's like, it's another planet, you know. I would, say that, I would say that here in France, um, just know that even if you get married to a French citizen here, you do not get a work permit. All you get is the right to work. You have to find the work, get them to give you a special letter, you have to rush it to the correct agency. You have to pay a fee, and you will get a permit only for that job. And you have to rush the permit back to them and pray that the job is still open, and it probably isn't. So you've spent your money for nothing because they found somebody else. And um, it'll work for that job. But And, and students... Unfortunately, I don't recommend work coming here on the student thing. Everybody I know here who did that had major, major problems with it. Your status is not secure, and you can only work a ridiculously small number of hours a week. You know. You know. You know what's interesting? We haven't talked about this before, though. What if you're doing a startup? You have so many technology companies coming and and starting up. Um, just all over the globe. I think I was reading something in, um, in Israel because what you have there, you've got a lot of the, the ex-military that are coming and starting technology companies because they're, they're taught to work as a group and to problem solve. So they're, yeah. they're coming straight from the military and starting uh, tech, high-tech startups. So I'm what, what about somebody, remember. do you see that in France as much? Is that you have a certain section? When I first came here, there was a program that I didn't know about until later. I was very frustrated, where France was rolling out the red carpet for people from other countries to come in and with their own money set up their own small business. I don't believe that exists anymore. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh yeah, I, I studied for about 10 years to figure out how to do it, and the regimes will change, which is one of the reasons that a book on how-to really isn't useful unless it's updated annually, well, that, and it won't, it won't apply from region to region. Yeah, that, that, goes, that goes back to, to getting someone like yourself and helping them sort through all this. For each region, yeah. you probably need somebody, and... You know, as far as uh, a business setup, sometimes for some professions, I, I do know uh, a legitimate contact who would be happy, perhaps, to to hear from them and work work with them. Well, Lisa, um, let's this, before we go here, let's touch a little hmm. bit uh, more on your on your current work here. Now, you you're working with the art. Is it the art uh, work frequent? Yeah. What is that that you're working on? It's on um, a series of French books. Did, did I say the are, name correct, though? What, what is the correct name? Freakwave, yeah. Art, is it Artwork Freakwave? 
It's 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 freak wave. Freak it's wave. Two words. Okay. And the title in French is La Vague Celerate, but they usually just use the English freak wave. It's mostly visual art. They're small, very quality, high high quality um, art books, but they have text in various languages. And I've written for all five, and I have art in the first one and the fifth one that's about to come out. It's really edgy stuff, and it's it's it kind of defies description. I would say it's adult in nature. It's not pornographic, but it's so bizarre. <laughs> Well, how, how can people doing, uh, outside of France get get this piece? How can they? How can they? They get lost this? their distributor after the third um, issue, but uh, one of the editors and publishers is a neighbor of mine, um, the artist Anne van der Linden, and anybody can contact me, and I can get them a copy, either from me or through her. Okay, so that's going through cutecatfaith.com. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, yeah. so. Lisa, I cannot thank you enough for sticking with me today and uh, talking oh, about great. France. And I hope you enjoyed it. Did you enjoy talking with us? Yes, and I think, I hope, that people have specific questions mm -hmm. that perhaps we may want to address in the future. Sure. Well, I'd love to have you back on again. If anybody would like to, to email me, they can always email me at rich <clears throat> at travelotours.com. And if, for a future episode, if there are any questions you want to ask Lisa about moving to France or coming there and spending over a week or two on vacation, I'm sure we can go ahead and address those and uh, give you some great information. Lisa, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for being in Travel Tours today. And uh, thank you for volunteering to come back and speak with us again. You're very welcome. Thank you, Lisa. You have a great day.